We have four different stations. Uh, we've got our V60 station, um, Aeropress station, Siphon station, and Cold Drip station. Uh, and this makes up our brew bar, which gets a lot of attention. Um, so people can come up and read what we have on each station. So for instance, on the V60, we have Tanzanian AAA, um, also Guji, Ethiopian Guji. Um, if they like the sound of that, then they can uh, ask the waitress if they can have an Ethiopian Guji on the V60. What's a V60? Is that just a name? Uh, yeah, that, that's a pour over. So V60 is just the, the name because of the shape of it. Ah, okay, alright. So, and and there's, does the 60 refer to the sides? Uh, yeah, I think it? that's the angle of it. Yeah. So it's at a, a very specific angle, um, just because that is what yeah. how it pours best. Um, yeah, I'll just go through the siphon first, because it's bubbling away. Um, has anyone ever seen a siphon before? Yeah. yeah. It's also called a vac pot in some places. But basically, we have a heating element down the bottom. Um, this is a halogen lamp, but mm. in other places it can be an open flame. Uh, that's a bit less controlled though, so yeah, I can turn the temperature up and down quite easily here. It's a bit harder with the flame. Also, you, you try on the bottom of the, the bowl here. Um, but basically, this is a vacuum seal. So if, when I vacuum seal that, um, the gases in the bottom chamber are going to expand. Uh, which will cause the water to rise into the top chamber. And if you can see, in the middle here, we have a, a cloth filter, which is where your filter sits. Um, yeah. So it's all going to happen quite quickly when it happens, so I'll explain it first. So the water is going to rise into this chamber. Um, I have 40 grams of coffee here, which I'm going to grind a tiny bit coarser than, um, than filter coffee, just because it's a, a cloth filter, mm -hmm. you need a, a bit of a coarser grind. Um, grind that up, put it into the top chamber, let it brew for around a minute and a half, uh, dabbing it slightly. Uh, then I'll take it off the heat and it will get sucked back down into the bottom chamber. Uh, that's again because of the gases compressing this time and it sucks it back down. Uh, yeah. So I'll get started. It is quite a big process. So. Okay. so you can see the water starting to creep up. And like I said, that's because it's heating up, the water's heating up in this bottom chamber. The water has nowhere to go when it evaporates because it is vacuum sealed there. So there's a hole in the middle of this tube, it's getting pushed up. So the water is actually at boiling temperature, it's not at a different temperature. Actually, the pressure, it is at a different no, it's not at boiling temperature, that's, right. a, that's a big factor because you don't want to brew coffee at boiling temperature. Right. It does look like it's boiling, mm -hmm. but that's just because gases are trying to escape. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It would be too hot if it was boiling. Mm -hmm. So what sort of temperature is it? Uh, I would that. say that's about 95. Okay, mm -hmm. just, just yeah. yeah. Um, for filter coffee, it's best to brew it 93 to 95. The so so method, method that was popularized in America by Silex. Mm -hmm. By what? Sorry? Silex. Oh, yeah? S I L E X. They, they made those going back half a century or yeah. more. Yeah, in just San like Fran, is that right? Sorry? In San Francisco. Uh, I'm not sure where it was made, but they were all over the country. Yeah. I, they, they still are. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, they're quite they, 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 they don't look so so scientific. <laughs> <as this. laughs> they probably didn't have this little guy <laughs> at the bottom. Um, cool. I'm going to grind up the coffee now. The um, reason I left it till now is because it's best to do it just before you brew it, uh, so you don't lose any aroma. downstairs. 
so, like any good barista, we have a little timer here to time everything. And I've weighed the beans, 40 grams. I'm going to start. So this is going to sit here for however long I leave it on the heat because it's at an equilibrium. And I'm literally just going to dab it just to saturate all the grinds. So you, if you can see, the grinds are going kind of a caramel brown colour, which is nice. Um, if you hit a really pale yellow, that means it's over extracting, which means your, your coffee might taste quite bitter. A pale yellow? Yeah. But where um, would it go pale yellow at the top? Yeah, just, I don't know if you can see, but if, you, if it comes into contact too much with hot water, okay. it will go really pale yellow. So we're at a minute now. I'm going to leave it another 30 seconds and give it a stir uh, and then take it off the heat. I'm going to blow on the bottom as well and that has a purpose. It, <laughs> it cools it down quite rapidly so the water starts getting sucked down straight away. Over the next 30 to 40 seconds, it's going to come back through that cloth filter in there. So that's what all under former pressure, is it? Um, yeah, so yeah. basically the gases in, in this bottom chamber are now compressing. Okay. So it's kind of sucking more air from the top back down. And this coffee is quite fresh, so it is a little bit bubbly. It's mm -hmm. got more carbon in it as well. How much would that kit cost? Um, probably about a hundred pounds. I think. Good value. Yeah, yeah that's pretty. Really mm. mm -hmm. uh, that's not with the halogen lamp, though. Right. That's a bit more expensive. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a shame. But that's very, very expensive. Is it? Or what? No, I mean the, the, the halogen. The yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. How much would that be then? Uh, I'm not even sure. How oh, do you Google. use any halogen? You could, yeah, you could just use a flame, but then that would blacken the bottom. That's, yeah, yeah you've got to make it. I don't understand what the advantage is of that system over, say, preparing some water at 95 degrees or thereabouts, allowing the grains to steep it, and then putting it through a filter, because that's all we A lot of people ask that. Um, I find that, I don't know, um, in the siphon, you know how you saw the bubbles going from yeah. the bottom upwards? Yeah, it's kind of like a popcorn effect. Like it's, it's kind of touching all the coffee evenly, um, aerating it, and getting all the flavours extracted it evenly. Yeah, so I find when you're making coffee, it's all about even surface area contact. So I think the siphon really achieves that. Um, it really highlights the sort of higher floral notes as well. Okay. Would you say your coffee to the customers coming here? Is this how you would serve your coffee generally? Um, only if they ask for it. Okay. Uh, for instance, with the siphon, it's eight twenty for two people. That's really good. Um, so we get maybe three, four a week. Not too many. Is that all? Yeah. Well, it does. It takes a lot of labour time, so how we don't really want to. How long does it take to ten a minute? Um, does it take the whole process? Usually? The whole process, maybe uh, 15 minutes, because it's got to heat up. And the actual brewing doesn't take that long. 
Yeah, I'll serve this up so we can have a little taste. Thanks for coming down, everybody. Um, I haven't met you yet. My name's James. Um, myself and Lizzie, Lizzie over here. Um, okay. We're co owners here at Ozone. Um, and I'm the head roaster. Um, Courtney, who you've already met, she's our head barista, she's also our trainee, trainee roaster. So Courtney's getting more involved in this, this side of things. Um, so yeah, did you enjoy the cipher? <laughs> cool, cool. It is possible to get it wrong for that ball in the bottom there to explode. <laughs> Shower you in broken glass well, and hot water. Well, I noticed the safety screen, so yes. I thought there yeah. must be a risk. So you've made it this far. That's good. Yeah, um, yeah this is our roaster. This is where we, we roast our coffee. If you haven't seen green beans before, there's some on the counter behind you. Feel free to grab some, have a look, have a feel, have a smell. I wouldn't advise tasting them. You can, but they're pretty tough and nuggety. And obviously, we've got the cafe upstairs, um, but down here, um, it's a bit of a big boys' toy, really. I suppose um, we we uh, bring green beans in from different parts of the world, and we blend them, or we roast them as single origin coffees, um, and. We also use them in the cafe upstairs, or we supply other cafes and restaurants around London, the UK, starting to venture a little bit outside of the UK as well. So, uh, how many places do you supply? Uh, about 50 wholesale customers at the moment. So, yeah. Yeah. so, we've been here for about a year and a half now. And did you bring Ozone over from tomorrow, or did you start it here? So, Ozone um, began in New Zealand. In 1998. Um, so? I thought maybe. Yeah. 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 So there's quite a thriving uh, specialty coffee industry mm. in New Zealand. Mm. Um, the coffee roasting industry sort of grew um, sort of symbiotically with, with the independent cafe market over there, and they're both, both very strong. Um, and, uh, but also now, so we say, for example, the population of four million people in New Zealand is about 150 roasters. So if you compare that to London, there are seven million people. I think maybe there's about a dozen roasters, maybe 15 now. There's not many people roasting in London, I don't think. Um, so uh, yeah, obviously quite quite sort of different markets. Um, so yeah, saw the opportunity to bring Ozone Coffee Roasters to London and um, yeah, sort of get on with it and supply people with, uh, with great coffee, hopefully. Um, so yeah, we, we bring, so this is, this is all our green bean stock sort of sitting around the place um, from different parts of the world. So good coffee grown regions generally uh, seen as Central America, South America, East Africa. Um, so we've got some Brazil coffee here. Uh, this is from El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, Tanzania, Ethiopia. Um, some more Ethiopian coffee over here. Um, so yeah, quite a mix. Um, and do you buy direct? Uh, in a lot of instances, yes. Some through brokers uh, that we have a good relationship with here in the UK, um, and then some, uh, for example, the Brazil here, direct to farmers. Same with the Ethiopian coffee from the Romia Co Co op. Um, yeah. Is it set itself like on a, for example, a pack of coffee? Is it set itself time and probably happy to get the beans? Um, yeah, as, as green beans, I mean, you, you can potentially use it within a year, um, but we prefer to use it sooner, so the fresher the better. Okay. It does take a while to get here, obviously from origin, so um, you know, once it's processed and then bagged and shipped, it 
can take a few months to get here yeah. um, after harvest. But um, yeah, the, the fresh air you can use for yeah. yeah. So if you taste, sometimes when we do a cupping like this and you taste um, an old crop versus a new crop of the same coffee, you'll, you'll notice the difference. Uh, it's, it's quite significant. Yeah. How many times can you harvest in a year? Uh, depends on the origin. So some, some only once, sometimes two. Um, so Brazil, for example, have a, a, an early harvest and a late harvest. Um, so yeah. When, when are they? Uh, so it varies from origin to origin. So um, Brazil, I think early harvest, um, probably about now actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Is it around the region of Bahia where you, you, where you get your coffee? Bahia? Sorry? From the region of Bahia, you buy your coffee from there, or the region of Bahia in Brazil. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not sure okay. Have right. um, yeah. you ever had coffee from Congo? Congo, mm -hmm. we have cut some. Yeah, we haven't actually um, we haven't actually roasted any on this on this roaster. Um, but yeah. And is there a difference between the early and the late harvest? Uh, there the can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. As a, as a sort of organic product, coffee, there's, there's quite a few similarities with wine. Um, so there's lots of different uh, uh, sort of strains of varieties of, of green coffee, of, of Arabica coffee. Um, and they can all come with their own sort of uh, characteristics. Um, and then there's also the part of, as with wine, terroir. So climate conditions, soil conditions, all that sort of thing will um, affect the flavour that you can get, get from the coffee. You hear a lot of talk about uh, Blue Mountain coffee. I know it's quite yep. rare. Um, what do you think about that yourself? Uh, we don't. No? It's, we mm -hmm. tend, well, it's quite expensive as well. It, it is quite expensive. So, I think mm -hmm. it's more so to do with how rare it is, oh, maybe, yeah. than the quality of it. Yeah. Several yeah. years ago, the, the, yeah. the Guild had a, had a Blue Mountain workshop. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, at which point I decided that, uh, that uh, there was a lot of hype involved. Yes, yes. I heard that as well. Yeah, I mean, not, not something we really, we, we really do. Uh, Is it true when you roast coffee, after about 24 hours, it's a bit like bread, it goes stale? You have to use it as quick as possible? You do. The flavor? Actually, you can have coffee that's too fresh. So um, straight after roasting, yeah. um, it, uh, we usually have it set in the bins for three to four days. Okay. It goes through a degassing process after roasting, so it's releasing a lot of gas. In espresso, especially, um, that gas, if you use the coffee too fresh, can can make it too lively, too sort of it reactive. Because well. uh, it's quite espresso is quite a violent process as it is, and then you have that um, if, if you use coffee that's too fresh, then yeah, it can be a little bit too temperamental. Um, so yeah, it is good to have a sort of resting period yes. for about three or four days. Oh, right, okay. um, mm. And then I think coffee's probably good from day four after roasting through to about day 21 after roasting. So for our wholesale customers, we're, given, we're delivering to them on a weekly basis Trying to, to make sure they're rotating stuff all the time. Absolutely. Yeah, mm. so um, I think, I mean, uh, Courtney and the guys upstairs, they're, they're very attuned to when the coffee's peaking and I think they usually find, especially with the blends, it's peaking around sort of day eight or nine after roasting for its absolute, absolute sort of peak. And health benefits as well for good coffee. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are the good benefits for that? Oh, Look at okay. us. Yeah. I mean, don't you? Is it behind a good health benefit? We don't know. <laughs> no. I don't know. You see all sorts of things in papers. Cholesterol in the body and stuff. It's pretty good for that. And there's a lot of hype around the green coffee bean. Yeah. Again, there's a lot of. So, so we gather. Yeah. The latest. There's been quite a lot of exposure of the hype around it. What do you mean? It's bad. That it, 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 exactly. There's no actual proof. Yeah. It seems that yeah. they, they can discover that it can prove the idea that yeah. green beans. You know, there are some medications now made, and even some instant drinks which supposedly yeah. contain okay. ground up green bean because it's good for well, like well, 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 yeah, exactly. Well. Yeah. If you abstain yeah. from drinking coffee, you don't live longer. It just seems longer. Seems longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Might be some wine, indeed. Yeah. Good one. Cool. So yeah, this is our roaster. Um, it's a uh, it's a German-built roaster made by a company called Probat, who have been making 
roasters for a very long time. Um, this is a, this roaster is from 1971. Um, as with our roaster in New Zealand, we quite like sort of the, the more vintage style yeah, probets. Um, the main reason being we really like the build quality of roasters back then. Um, and, and the important parts for us is, is the casting. So this front plate here, um, the back plate and the drum. Um, and the quality, the build quality of those is, is really good. Um, and what that means to us as roasters is consistency. So once it's up to, up to temperature, it's very good at providing a very cons consistent environment in which to roast coffee. Um, so we, we bought this as, as a vintage roaster, um, but then had it completely reconditioned. Um, so the, this is a UG22 Probat. Uh, the 22 stands for theoretically how much green coffee you can roast at a time. So 22 kgs of green coffee. Uh, we tend not to do that. We use, usually do 15 kgs of green coffee at a time. Um, but the old style uh, UG22 has a really big motor at the back and it drives two fan belts. One fan belt comes down here um, to do the cooling tray fan um, and one fan belt used to go up to here to do the hot air fan. Um, two great big fan belts going around all the time, not very sort of health and safety <coughs> in the cafe environment. So, um, yeah, we got a company called IMS, they, they split all those motors out, got rid of the fan belts and, um, yeah, we did all the wiring, all the, um, all the controls and everything, so uh, theoretically it works, we want it to work. Um, but we'll just fire it up and get it going. So basically, very simple bit of kit. We've got what's pretty much a cement mixer on top of our burners. So um, you can see, you might be able to see in the front there the drum moving around. And then you might be able to see through the holes in the side there, there's three rows of gas burners um, just sitting underneath and heating the bottom of the, the, bottom of the drum. So, yeah, as I said, we start off with 15 kgs of green coffee, um, which looks like this. Um, so that's um, a made-up uh, bucket of our ozone espresso blend. Um, and that goes in the top here. And when we've got the right temperature in the drum, and the right air temperature um, coming through the drum, then we release the beans into the drum. So, so they fall through into the drum. So we start off with a drum temperature, which is read by this temperature probe here, of about 135 degrees centigrade. And we have a hot air temperature, which is read by a dial just up the side here. So that's basically the air that's getting pulled through here and up into this part. Um, that's at about 190 degrees. Um, and that's when we drop the beans into the drum. And obviously at that point, you can fill the drum with cold beans and the temperature, the temperature in the drum plummets. And then basically we start a timer and we're logging the temperature increase minute by minute from that point on. So we're basically letting the temperature climb back up to the point where we bring the coffee out. And we're following a set profile, depending on which blend we're doing or which coffee we're doing, we're just following a set time and temperature profile. Um, different coffees um, respond better to different profiles. So some coffees um, like a little bit more heat, some a little bit less, um, some we take a little bit longer, some a little bit shorter in time. So um, most take about between 12 and 14 minutes um, and towards the end of the most 
we're using this a lot of the time, which is our sampler, which allows us to take a sample of the beans out of the drum and allows us to assess the colour, how the colour of the bean is progressing. That's why we've got the good light here. Um, so obviously all, mostly coffee is brown, but we're looking for a certain degree of brown. And uh, once we've got that, we need to get the coffee out of the drum as quickly as possible and try and cool it down as quickly as possible. So we'll open up the door, spill the beans into the tray here. These arms will be moving around. And uh, with the idea that we need, we don't want the beans sitting on top of each other and holding on to the heat. They're very good at holding on to heat. Um, so we need them moving around. And then we also have the cooling tray fan going, which I'll just pop on. So that's a fan underneath that's basically pulling air through the beans, um, room temperature air, and exhausting it on the back up top there. Um, again, just to try and cool it down as quickly as possible. Let's The other parts of the roast that we see at the back here, so this sort of tubular cone looking thing is called a roaster cyclone. Uh, basically what's happening is through this flue here, we've got hot air being pulled through the drum and lots of particulates and smoke come off the beans. Um, the air rotates in this cyclone and hopefully the majority of the particulates fall into the bin um, at the bottom. So the last sort of remnants of the coffee cherry. Yeah. You can use it for compost. Yeah. Yeah. So on the green bean, it's called a silver skin, but then it sort of peels off. So you, so you judge the roast entirely on colour, do you? No. We follow a time and temperature yeah. profile, but towards the end of the roast, yeah, we're looking for a certain colour, and that's when we'll bring the roast out, and we've met that, that well, colour. I, I, another roaster that I visited years ago talked about listening for the double crack. Yeah, so that there's, there, there's a first crack and a second crack. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they, they are good indicators as well. Um, but we tend to either bring our coffee out just as it's just starting to go into second crack or even before that, so you can't always use that as an indication. The first crack happens around sort of nine and a half minutes time, so basically the coffee is releasing mainly, mainly moisture. It's got to the point where it's reached a temperature that just has to get a lot of the moisture that's within it out and it's, it increases in size by about a third and it just sort of opens up a little bit like popcorn and you can hear it in there um, sort of popping away like popcorn can you actually hear that sound yourself are you using this crack sound yeah no it's quite it's quite, quite distinctive yeah yeah you can you can hear it through the drum but you can also open this up it helps um, hear a little bit clearer as well How many hours a day would you yourself spend here sort of roasting coffee for the clients? Uh, well, I don't do as much roasting as I used to, um, but we're probably roasting now for about 30, 35 hours a week, I think. So most days. Any other questions? Times and the temperatures, is that a matter that you work out by trial and error? And is each batch different? Is each vintage, is it very different? And each harvest? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so you can get roasters, it's like a push button roaster. You, you put the coffee in, press a button, and it, and it will follow the profile for you. Um, we, we believe that 
coffee as an organic product is quite reactive to humidity changes, temperature changes, and even on a daily basis, the coffee or the roaster even will perform slightly differently. So we believe in the manual aspect of it to always sort of put it back into line and um, yeah, get the result that we want. So yes, we do want to be quite attentive to it. And you know, the, 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 roast will, the roast will behave very differently, for example, in the middle of winter. Um, that's good. Compared to now. <coughs> Obviously, I noticed that you've got a lot of heat here. Do you actually recycle the heat from this into the um, property? Or? Um, no, well, not intentionally, no. It's pretty warm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, yeah. winter. It's just yeah. quite warm in here at the moment. Yeah, yeah. No, it does get rather warm in here at the moment. Yeah, but it is good in winter. Yeah, so the big black ugly black box at the back there is our, is our filtration. Um, so traditionally, or, or one of the methods that's been used a lot for uh, cleaning up the exhaust from roasters is an afterburner. Um, not very efficient, so you're, you're producing uh, gas, hot gas, which is potentially 200 degrees centigrade and you use a big metal afterburner uh, using more gas to burn it at a hotter temperature, say 400 degrees centigrade. Um, yeah, not very efficient use of uh, natural resources um, and not very, again, another big heat source in the environment like this. So we've gone for, um, this is fairly new technology um, by the same company actually that made this, this roaster and it uses a powder to help filtrate the exhaust um, and uh, yeah, the, the powder does need replacing every now and then but it uh, seems to be very effective um, Yeah, because there's not a trace of smoke being on your residue on the walls and that oh, was the first thing yeah. I noticed Well everything's exhausted so I mean the main thing is we want to be we want to be good neighbours yeah. and we know we've got people living above us, we don't want to be uh, annoying them too much. Um, but yeah, the film the film seems to be doing a pretty good job. Yeah, fantastic. Your particular um, personal taste in your own coffee, what, what sort of blend would you go for yourself? Sorry? Your particular own personal taste in coffee, what sort of blend would you go for yourself when you don't have a blend or I think that the, one of the fun, really fun aspects of what we do is that always try new coffees. Um, there's certainly ones that we have as sort of favourites, but yeah, as new harvests and new new coffees we get exposed to. Um, that that's the really fun part of it. So um, I suppose discovering new coffees rather than being too obsessed with old ones. So uh, yeah, I think we do treat them as a product that sort of comes through, and you get to experience them for a certain amount of time, and then and then they're gone. Um, so you're looking for the next one. Um, we might move over to a cupping table. And so this is the first part of the cupping process. Um, we smell the coffee as it's just freshly ground. Um, so yeah, this is our cupping table. Um, we quite like it because we can dribble coffee everywhere and it doesn't really show. Um, it's quite a nice height as well. But uh, yeah, cupping is a process that we use to evaluate different coffees, um, usually different single origin coffees. Um, there could be a number of reasons why we why we do this, um, one's to sort of assess the flavour profile and the characteristics of the coffee. Um, we might use, we might cup the same coffee that's roasted in three slightly different ways, for example, if we want to assess the roast profile or roast degree. Um, so, yeah, it's a really helpful tool for us. Um, 
we do it like this, we taste coffee like this as opposed to tasting as, as espresso because um, it's a lot easier to get the characteristics out of the coffee like this. It's, 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 um, it's, yeah, it's easier to get the different flavour characteristics. Um, espresso, if you drink espresso a lot, it's, it's quite intense, it's quite full on um, and it's quite easy to get quite fatigued if you, if you drink a lot of espresso. So we do sometimes do espresso tastings you know, you drink six or seven espressos in a row and you start to, you start not to taste much at all. Um, so yeah, this is a bit more like the sort of filter style that, that you tried upstairs, so hopefully these coffees will, will taste um, quite different. Got some really nice coffees for you. Um, so the first one, so basically the first one is the one closest to the stairs for everyone. So whether you're on this side of the table or that side of the table. So that's, that's the first one. So this one is a coffee from El Salvador um, called San Emilia. We use a lot of this coffee, we use it in one of our blends, uh, but we also brew it um, as a single origin upstairs. So this was the one you had as the siphon upstairs. The second one we've got is an Ethiopian coffee which is smelling amazing actually. Yeah, it's very kind of very chocolatey, but also quite like um, fresh almonds. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is a natural processed coffee. We'll talk about processing a little bit in a minute. But um, yeah, this one's um, from uh, here we call Guji or Shikiso Mill. And the third one is a coffee from Tanzania from Ravuma. So the glass is obviously for water, you might just want to refresh your palate in between the coffees. Second one for spitting, if you don't want to drink too much coffee tonight and you want to sleep. Um, the last one is for your spoon, so in between, when we actually get to taste the coffees, just to rinse off your spoon in between so we don't sort of cross-contaminate. You feel it on the water? We do. This this isn't filtered actually, but the uh, the water we use for all of our coffee and the supply of our coffee machines is filtered. So that's uh, really important, especially in, in London. Um, London water is quite bad in terms of how hard it is and the, and the dissolved solids within the water. Um, and when we're sort of talking about anything, really tea or coffee. Um, anything where we're sort of infused in the water and flavour. Um, hard water or water with high total, um, high um, dissolved solids, uh, it's less hungry for flavour basically. Less hungry, did you say? Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So, um, for example, so we, we, we take TDS readings, total dissolved solids. So and it gives you. Um, a number, parts per million, of the dissolved solids within the water. Um, London water, we find, comes into here at about 270 parts per million. Um, we have got quite a sophisticated water filtration system, just sitting under the stairs over there. Um, you'll hear it sort of going away. Um, after that, we can get water on the other, out, out of that at about 70 parts per million. So it cleans it up quite a bit. But in comparison, I was up in the Lake District the other day putting in a new machine and we tested their water and their water straight out of the tap was 30 parts per million. So we've it's got... It's really funny because my dad lives in the Lake District yeah. and the same coffee that I make in London tastes totally different. It does taste different, yeah. yeah. Much better. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Even when we use filter coffee, yeah. it's just... It's Even incredible. in Naples, apparently, in Napoli, um, again, they, they say their water is relatively dirty. Yeah. It's really common in yeah. their coffee. Okay. Um, yeah. So that seems to sort of maybe the acidity in their water. Or, and uh, they're very passionate about it. They're literally, you know, this is where the water yeah. is from for their coffee. This is the drinking water. Yeah. So it's quite uh, interesting how it actually changes. Yeah, the some places are, are lucky. Um, I mean, we were over in Amsterdam. Uh, the other, I've got a customer over there, they uh, don't use any sort of filtration and their 
coffee tastes really good. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's uh, yeah, we have to pay yeah. two and a half thousand pounds for a filtration system, mm -hmm. and we still don't get water as, as good as, mm -hmm. as those guys. So, mm -hmm. but uh, that's all right. That's, that's living in London. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, even when if you're making coffee at home, if you, if you go into this trouble and the expense of buying um, good quality coffee, then try and use some filtered water. Even the filtered filter, you know, the ones that sit in the fridge, um, just a just a really good idea to use filtered water. Um, yeah, probably the two best tips for, for making well, three, three three tips for making coffee at home. Yeah, use use good beans and get good quality beans. Try and buy beans and the second tip, have a grinder for home, even this little hand grinder. You'll get so much more out of the coffee if you grind it fresh and using filtered water. Why did you say use filtered water? Because you don't, because the water has so much particles in you don't yeah. taste. Yeah. The other thing with, with water a lot of, um, is uh, pH level. So if you have uh, water that's uh, too alkaline, um, it can strip out the acidity in the coffee. And acidity in coffee can be a good thing. It's a good acidity. Um, so uh, yeah, that can flatten out the coffee as well. Um, so that's one of the, again, using the Amsterdam people as an example, they use a blend that is the more sort of acidic, fruity end of the, of the beans that we offer, um, and it actually does taste a lot better over there because that acidity is not stripped out so much. So yeah, feel free, we're, we're not going to quite get stuck in yet, um, but the next step for us is to smell these as they're steeping. So we're just going to let them steep and brew, we're not going to disturb them. Um, also, it's too hot to taste at the moment, um, but feel free to uh, give them a smell now. Sometimes the sort of aroma characteristics of the coffee does change from, from dry to wet. It's too little for me to do you choose them specifically for dramatic contrast? Or yeah, they are quite contrasting. I mean, they're all coffees that we really enjoy. Um, but the, yes, they are quite contrasting. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's fun doing a cupping like this when, when there's, there's quite a lot going on there. Uh, sometimes, yes. uh, if, you, if you've got 20 Indonesians on a table and you're choosing one for blend, that can be a bit tricky. Quite often, they smell very similar. But, um, and for a blend, you'd be looking for different balances, like acidity from one and nothing yes, from another. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So usually within a blend, each coffee will provide, it will play a different role mm. in that blend. Um, so if you've got one of the coffee, might provide the sort of fruit flavour, one might provide the body, one might provide the acidity. Um, so yes, um, Indonesian coffee, for example, good. No, no really strong pronounced flavour characteristics, but good at providing body in the blend. So, yeah, like I say, if you've got 20 Indonesians on a the table, there's probably not going to be any big sort of standout variations in flavour, but um, it's maybe more the body that you're, you're trying to... You notice on the top as well, on the surface, you have the bitter salt levels of all those gases that yeah. almost produce in the surface. And the same quantity of coffee in each cup. It might be to do, yeah. I mean, normally if, if we were being really pedantic about this, we would be using samples that were all roasted at the same time. Yeah. Uh, but there's probably a bit of difference in the age of these coffees, so that might have something to do with that. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of froth on one, and um, the middle one seems to be a lot lighter than mine anyway. So in terms of the evaluation, a lot of what we're thinking about is, is the aroma and what we're getting in terms of the aroma. So as you're probably aware, what we can actually taste, what we can sense on our tongue is quite limited. Sweet, salty, sour, bitter. There's the fifth one which is umami, which is the sort of savoury MSG kind of flavour. but 
As with wine, again, you know, the mechanism is parallel to wine, but um, so much of what we experience and what we enjoy about coffee is to do with, with the aroma. Um, supposedly, there's more aroma um, characteristics within coffee than wine. We'll just talk a little bit about processing. So, we'll start off with this one. This coffee is the middle one, is the Ethiopian Guji, which is a natural process or sun-dried processed coffee. So the processing is basically how at origin they remove the cherry skin and the pulp from the bean. So the cherries are picked, hopefully nice and ripe. Usually within the cherries we've got two beans, um, so most coffee beans have a flat side and a rounded side, and the beans sit two to a cherry inside like that. Um, so the processing method is how they remove the pulp and the skin from the bean. Sun-dried method is, is the more traditional method, and basically, as you probably guess, they get the cherries, they lay them out in big patios and drying beds um, and they just leave them out in the sun for the sun to sort of bake off and dry off the cherry uh, from the bean. They're raked over daily so hopefully they get a nice even drying. How long um, would you leave them out for? Um, I think it can be up to sort of three or four weeks. It's really? As long as that? Because um, they go through a drying process as well. Um, but in theory, this process helps impart a lot of fruit flavour to the coffee. Um, natural processed coffees are usually uh, quite good for body as well, They're good body, um, but generally a bit low on the acidity. Um, so that's natural processed. That's how, that's how chocolate would be dry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, not for as long as that, that's why I was surprised. Yeah. They're normally really unusual to do it. Uh, Um, Are there any possible dangers through leaving it so long? Uh, natural processed coffee can be a little bit more inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you can um, so you can even see in the sort of colour variation of the bean. There's some sort of some more sort of brown brown ones, some lighter ones, and you even see it as a roasted bean as well. There's uh, it's more sort of colour variation. So you've got some lighter ones, darker mm -hmm. ones. Um, so yeah, sun dried is it's not as consistent as this process, which is washed, fully washed. Um, so that's the Tanzanian coffee, uh, is a washed coffee. Um, basically, they go to a, a wet mill and slightly different types, but um, it's sort of like a rolling device of water going through it, and the pulp and the skin is broken off the cherry. Um, a lot more, a, a faster process and a lot more consistent and even process. Um, but more aggressive? Like yeah. you can strip some of the character out of the coffee or not? Well, it's general sort of characteristics of, of wet process, <coughs> probably a little bit less body than, than the natural process, um, but uh, usually better flavour clarity um, and usually um, more acidity. So, um, yeah. And then there's, this is the El Salvador coffee. This is the third one we've got. Um, and this is a pulp natural coffee. So it's kind of um, a cross between the two where the skin's removed from the cherry and then the uh, bean with the pulp still around it is, is drying in the sun. Um, so. What have you removed? Isn't that fermented with it? There is a fermented fermentation part. Yeah. You've still got the pulp on, aren't you? Fermenting it. Yeah. There is a fermentation part of the process. But only in that in that method. In the sun dry. Yeah. Not in the sun dry. This this one, the one in the middle, the Salvador one. Yeah. Yeah. It's in both of those. The green bean is what once you've been extracted from a cherry. How is that extracted? I mean, so they just 
broken apart or well, with the sun dried, it's part yeah. of the as, as it's being raked, so that the skin and the just dries off and breaks off. Okay. And then with the wet process coffee, it's yeah part of the um, water being going over the the cherry and the and the bean just sort of breaks out. Not be able to but I go back into the ground. Will be recycled. Um, it can be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So we're just going to now break this crust that's formed on top. Um, we're just going to gently push this back and have another good sniff. It's, it's a really good um, way to um, assess the aroma again. Um, try not to go too deep because we don't disturb the grinds in the bottom. And once we've done this we're just going to remove this top sort of layer. We're going to get to taste some coffee. So we're going to get some first one in our spoon and we have a really good slurp with the idea of sort of aerating the coffee and spraying the back of the palate. Um, again feel free to, to spit the coffee out if you don't want to drink too much. And as well as thinking about the flavour we're now starting to think about Things like mouthfeel and body and acidity. It's a really big juicy fruit flavours from the middle one, from the Ethiopian. Yeah, well they're all, they're all great coffees. Um, the Guji I suppose to start off with, I mean it's, it's, all, it's all just big fruit. Apricots and you know really sweet, um, good body, uh, maybe not so much maybe not particularly acidic, um, but yeah, really, really delicious. Um, the Tanzanian, a little bit more sort of, I suppose like figs and muscovado sugar kind of um, into the scale. It's not sort of bright red fruits, it's um, more those sort of heavier notes. Um, probably, probably the more acidic of the three, I think. Um, and then the San Emilio, I mean, I've, we've had this for quite a while, uh, different crops of the San Emilio and sort of always enjoyed it. Um, for me, I really like the sort of orange zest kind of quality, so it's almost like the, I always, I always sort of liken it to the oils that you get out of orange zest, um, especially in the aftertaste. It might sort of sound a little bit unpleasant in some regards, but um, yeah, I really enjoy that sort of characteristic of the coffee. Um, yeah, all really quite contrasting, but really enjoyable coffees. But the great thing about coffee is it's, it's all personal preference, so um, yeah, there's no wrong or right answer. And do your different customers ask for different blends? Uh, wholesale customers. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we've got three different blends, and they're fairly contrasting. So, um, yeah, people who are interested in using our coffee, they'll come along, they'll do a test, taste test, take three different blends, compare them, and decide what's going to work best for them. So then we're going to move back upstairs, aren't we? Yes. And Courtney's going to do a couple more demos for you, different sort of methods. Cool. Making coffee at home. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, done. well, I thought I'd just give a demonstration of what I thought most people would have at home. So I'm going to do a, a V60 uh, and AeroPress. Has anybody seen the AeroPress? No, no, no. I've just taken off in the last five years. And for, like, a lot of people have been buying them for home use. Um, they're really easy and they do make a really lovely cup of coffee. Um, so that one looks really cool. And just the cafetiere French press. Everyone's probably got one of these. Um, cool. So, and I was just going to do the same coffee as I did in the siphon, the San Emilio, just so you can see how each um, method produces a different cup. Um, but firstly, who wants some of the cold drip to try? Um, I'll explain it first. We have been maxing this out over the summertime. Uh, everybody wants a bit of this, and it, it takes six to eight hours to make. So we've been 
selling more than we can make, which is good, I guess. Wow. Um, basically, we've got an ice chamber at the top, so we fill it with ice and filtered water. Um, it drips one drip every two to three seconds. Oh my god. And then down here we've got a uh, ground up coffee. It's quite coarse. Uh, down here we've got at the bottom we've got a ceramic filter so none of the grind comes through. And this little filter at the top just sort of makes mm. sure the water is spread evenly so you don't have any channeling or anything. So it drips through. Uh, then this glass coil sort of acts as a Capillarator, sort of drawing the drip down, and then it drips down here into the decanter, which is your coffee. Um, so the end result is really sweet. It's kind of like coffee juice um, wow. because it's a cold process. It's more delicate, so it does draw more of the sweeter flavors out of it. Um, yeah, so I'll give you a little taste. And it's got a thimble full. I guess eventually you get coffee stomach <laughs> In the winter. <laughs> it's really quite refreshing in the summertime. You don't, a lot of people don't have coffee or come in for coffee when it's hot because they don't want a hot beverage, but mm -hmm. this one's really nice. So that one is a uh, Ethiopian yeah. burger chef, so it's kind of like the middle one we cup downstairs with the fruit. Mm. Good heavens. This is the goji. No, it's not the goji, but it's another Ethiopian. Another Ethiopian. Another Ethiopian. Oh. Ethiopians are renowned for being fruity. Mm. We got that one from the USA, um, but yeah, I think it's been around a while. So I'll start with the V60. The pour over. This is a little one cup one. You can get, yeah, two cup ones to a double size. Um, and it's the same sort of uh, process for a Chemex as well, which are the really big ones. Um, what's the difference between that and, you know, the normal Melitta filled, you know, cones and so on that we might use at home? Um, like a percolator? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, if you use a filter system at home, they're, just, I mean, they're all 60 the degrees. It's just the nice glass. It's just a, mm. is that, that's the oh, only thing. Oh, yeah, this is just a one It's the same thing. thing. Yeah, it's basically. It's yeah. Thing. So it's, it's just, it's the standard filter system, basically. Yeah, yeah. The shape, definitely. Um, the filters you're using are? These ones um, are from Hario. So what I'm doing now, I'm just going to wet the filter. And that's good to do before you brew your coffee mm -hmm. because these filters, when they're produced, they're covered in bleach. Uh, so it kind of washes that off, washes the paper taste mm -hmm. off. Um, also gets it to stick to the glass, which is handy. I mean, you can buy unbleached coffee for whatever. Oh, they did it, but they're not Brown very good. Ones, yeah. Um, I think these ones are better just because they are the right shape. I think the brown ones tear quite easily. Yeah. I haven't really used many. Yeah. So it also heats the jug underneath. Another thing I say is uh, to keep everything at the same temperature. You don't want to lose any heat in the process. So the temperature of our water is around 93, 94 degrees, which is a really good filter coffee temperature. Um, another important thing is the ratio we use. So, as I mentioned before, a lot of people make the mistake of putting too much coffee in mm -hmm. when they're making filter coffee at home, and it does make a really bitter taste. So, we like to use uh, 1 gram uh, coffee to 15 gram water ratio, which is, yeah, a lot less than people would use at home, I think. So, it kind of looks like that. It's possibly one type of dessert. Yeah. 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 Keeping in mind this is for one, one cup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So one. So Um, there is a very technical sort of method that we use here. Um, we sort of experiment with it quite a lot. So some days we might put that little divot in, some days we might not. It 
really depends on the age, uh, the type of coffee, mm -hmm. um, on the different methods. But I'll just take you through what I'm doing. Don't worry about remembering the time or anything like that. I think the biggest thing to remember with this method is a consistent pour. Uh, like before touching as much surface area of the coffee as you can and evenly. So I have a little cool little scale here which has the weight and the time. So I'm going to start it. And what I'm doing now is um, just blooming the coffee. So by that I mean putting in 60 grams of coffee in the first 10 seconds um, and that just sort of gets it to expand. You can come over and you can see the gas gases escaping. Nice bubbles coming out. And you've got that nice caramel brown colour as well. Well this one, the Aeropress does make a quite sweet coffee and uh, it's quite different in texture and even appearance. Um, so how it works, you've got it's like a big syringe sort of uses air pressure to extract coffee. So we put a paper filter into there, which clicks onto here, and you brew your coffee with hot water in this section for however long you want. Push it down into a jug and oh, extract some yeah. mm -hmm. jug. Yeah. So yeah. you saw that on the MD account as well. You saw them here as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, 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 I saw so many. How does it differ from a French press? Um, the French press uses a metal filter, right. so it actually goes through the metal filter. Okay, and but this uses uh, so it's a similar air system air. basically, but it's just going through mm -hmm. through a, a, a paper filter. I mean, yeah. no, it's it's this is sort of pressurized. I mean, I think you'll see what happens. But okay. yeah, you do you see the air pressure right. forcing the coffee down. Um, so you're not actually. No, we'll, we'll wait and see what. Right. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll make the comparison afterwards. Just intrigued. So I'm sticking to that one gram uh, coffee to work a 15 gram water ratio. So I'm doing 14 grams. You do that regardless of the method. Yep. Is, is that because of the sort of bitterness quotient is always relative to the to that ratio of beans to water? Yeah. Um, with each method, it does vary slightly, but just in my experience, that's a good ratio to stick to. You can deviate with different methods. This is actually upside down. It's called the inverted method. Um, the reason for this, which we'll see, is so that I can control how long I can brew it for, or steep it for. So I can let that sit there for how long I want. Um, and then, so it is actually okay. brewing at the moment. Yeah, technically. And then you decide how long you want it to brew for. Yeah. So this one I'm going to brew for two and a half minutes. And then turn it over. So I've got my I wet, wet my paper filter again. It's always a good rule. And then that fits on top. It looks quite complicated, but once you get the hang of it, it's really easy. So, two and a half minutes, I'm going to flip that over. And then you'll be able to see a little space where I've been talking about the air pressure being pushing it down. So, with this one, I can find you, we can use espresso roast in it. Um, a quite light espresso roast. We generally use a filter roast for all our filters, which is really, really light. But in the Aeropress, um, yeah, some espresso roasts are really, really nice as well. Would it be better with espresso? Just saying that it's it's a possibility. Yeah, no, it's a possibility. Right. Um, yeah, I think our two trees blend uh, is one of the ones which tastes really good in here, even with a little bit of milk, dare I say it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You called it air press or air press? Error. Error. You got it on the empty counter, did yes. you? Yes. Yeah. 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 Y
So, yes, this again is a vacuum seal, so I know air is coming out the top, so that's just me leaning on it, pushing it down, again through that paper filter that I put in. Is there any requirement of pressure at all, or is it just... No, not really, I'm just okay. sort of leaning on it. If, um, if you do need to really push it down, it means your grind's too fine. Okay. A little mound, yeah. It's because oh, okay. I stirred it with the, oh, so this is the coffee start. Mount. And you should stir it. Yeah, it's just created an axis just to okay. create an even extraction. I think it's quite important also for this one to have a good grinder um, because it has a metal filter. So a lot of people think oh, you don't really need a good grind yeah. for Filter, but you do. Do you when you mean a good grind, what do you mean by good? Oh, good, sorry, like an even grind. Even. So bad grinders, they produce like really big parts and then really small parts. Okay. Um, so you can't really extract evenly. A good grinder will grind everything the same. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I presumably, I mean, I've always found with the cafetiere that you get a sort of sludge coming mm -hmm. through. So I presume that's too fine a grind. Yeah, um, that's because of the uneven. So grind. It's because we are neat, so however coarse they are. Yeah. yeah. Um, a little tip I did learn with this today is to let it brew for however long you need to brew it. And then scoop out the top grind, the top sludge. Oh. Apparently it lowers acidity. Oh. 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 Um, this one I'm letting brew for two and a half minutes. Um, bigger ones maybe three, four minutes. It does depend on the age as well. It's quite aged coffee. You want to let it sit for a bit less because it sort of dies earlier. And then pushing it down really slow as well. I think it's important. Thank you.